starting off this podcast, I just want everyone to, oh, Jesus Christ. I told you oh, it was going to explode. <laughs> Nobody forgot the. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I just want to stay starting off this podcast. Cheers to Michael. Oh, and our choice of beverage when we're not writing and when we're done writing is, 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 is Happy Dads. And the reason I like Happy Dads is because it's a seltzer. It doesn't have too much alcohol. I don't like to get too messed up. It also has electrolytes. So it gives me like a sense of uh, hydration and energy. Mm -hmm. Which it's like a Gatorade for adults. It's like a Gatorade for adults. So we're going to drink our Happy Dads since we're done riding here. And we're going to talk about um, the intro to this is the differences, or our, what we found differences between Ducati Europe and Ducati North America, where we're at right now. Because we've traveled around a little bit, so we're going to talk about that. Just to share some of our thoughts, opinions, and similarities on um, what it's like being part of the Ducati community in Europe, riding in Europe, and associating yourself with dealerships in Europe, and then also what that is exactly like translated back into the United States. So. So while you drink, I will say the biggest, the biggest difference that I see is in Europe, anyone that's involved with, the, with Ducati is like family bound into it. Like they are coming from their dad loved Ducati, their grandfather loved Ducati, really? or Ray, everyone I talk to just seem to have that like it inspired a passion behind it more than just, I feel like Ducati USA and the people we talk to out here in USA around Ducati are like, well, I worked around motorcycles like them and then I fell in love with Ducatis versus in Europe, it's like, no, this is just where it's like heritage. It's, where it's, they're born yeah, it's from, your, it's yeah. your heritage. Yeah, no, it, it is your heritage. <laughs> Literally, yeah, for makes really, you just yeah. want to do yeah. The and, pizza and the pasta, and it's like, like, like I was just telling Anar this earlier. People in Europe, they're used to commuting around bicycles, scooters, and motorcycles. Mm -hmm. It's part of the lifestyle heritage, and like how you said, there it's more like trans, like it's been transcended or passed on. I feel like in the states, we, we're, we're in Hollywood. You know, we got a lot of Hollywood. We've got a lot of show. We got the, mm -hmm. we got an actor riding a. Uh, Penningali SP or something like that, and then the guy on YouTube sees and he wants to buy it because mm -hmm. he was influenced by not necessarily the, like how you said the family and his dad and blah 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 further down because that's just the different lifestyle and the you know the community over in Europe. But the fact that he saw it more on ads, mm -hmm. more on display, yeah. And so I don't know if that was going back to what you're saying, but no, I, yeah, exactly. I, 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 I see, I see what it. you mean by when you say that because they're sold a Ducati in America like you're bred into wanting a Ducati in Europe. It's just a part of it. And I was going to say, that brings me to like another topic. I don't know if you and Nara talked about it, but we talked about it a lot in Switzerland. Yep. It's not about how fast you are. It's about how, like top speed wise, it's about how quickly you can do the normal things exactly, down the yeah. mountain. Because yeah. there's no need to risk losing everything you love just to like get that couple, like to hit 120 or 140 or 160. Sure, but it's, obviously we like to go flying on yeah. seeing the top even more cycles and obviously Switzerland is really strict that's yeah. why they do that but it was funny like how you mentioned our friends in Switzerland um it's called staying under the, the 80 kilometers all the roads there stop at like 80 kilometers which is like I don't know like 50 60 miles an hour something yeah. really terrible like really really slow and so the thing in Switzerland is staying under or like when you do a section of the road it was staying under the 80 kilometers and if you could stay under the 80 kilometers and never have hit that 80 kilometer limit mm -hmm. That means you were more leaned over in a corner than someone else. And if you went to the top of the mountain faster, above 80 or 100 kilometers, just because you want to be the fastest one up to the top, you weren't leaning far enough. So it's like this whole different lifestyle of being like, no, bro, it's not about going fast. It's how far you could get leaned over. In the United States, it's about how freaking fast how you can go. How fast and straight line. No one cares about how far you get leaned over yeah. on these desert roads here in California or anywhere in Arizona. They just like to, we just like to fly down and pass mm -hmm. supercars and stuff like that. But in Europe, it's like, how slow and low could you go? Mm. But that's also due to the fact that they're extremely strict <laughs> yeah. there. They got cameras and cops out the wazoo. You can't do anything in, in, in like illegal in Switzerland. I'm surprised that when we went through and back, we didn't get a speeding ticket. Not at all. One. We got them in France and in the Netherlands, but we didn't get them in, in Switzerland, thank God. Because some of I the riding the France we did there. Not during the time, but as soon as we pulled over, you're like, you definitely didn't see that speed camera. And I'm just like, Guess not, because well, there's like a few the times one too. straight road. I'm just like, oh, I'm going. Well, you saw where I got flashed too. Like, yeah. there's times where you saw cameras and I didn't, and vice versa. But I'd always go like this, or the flashing. Okay, just you know, this is for cops, right? You go like this, and when you go like this, pat your back, and you give that. That's a flash. So there's like two different meanings. Like, this is the police officer, like on the road, and this is a camera where you go like that. You just you want to let them know that there's a flash, so you can know it. 
And um, sometimes I'll, I'll like, I'll like want to do both, or I'll be like, there's a flashing camera police. Which I gotta say, coming away from the cover from the United States and never having ridden over there, it's such a, it's a really weird feel. Like when you get pulled over for the first time, or when you just get pulled over in general, and you're just like, stomach sink for a second. How am I gonna talk to this officer? Am I gonna be nice? Is he gonna be a dick to me? Are we gonna like get into this whole thing? Am I getting a ticket? Can I talk my way out of it? Over there, when you get the flash, it's like that same pit in your stomach drop, but it kind of just, like, huh. it, it's like, huh, just got a ticket. Yeah. Hmm. Just rolled away. And then I'm, I'm still just, I'm still going the same speed. <laughs> but it's Versus so funny here, because- here, it's like, I got a ticket, I'm going five under the speed limit everywhere I go from now on. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's funny how they implement the fear on that, like, uh, and you're, I mean, again, we're talking about different subjects, like road rules and stuff like that. Like here, we have more police officers really pulling over with the car and the scariness if you get seen or caught. But there, regardless, you're going to get a ticket, and you know that they're randomly everywhere, and it's just going to make you want to go slower and be safer on the road. When here, it's more of like the wild, wild west. And I'm curious to when they will probably maybe start implementing more cameras just to reduce the, the speed of traffic, probably especially in California. Well, they, they tried on the 101 near Olive, where I used to live. They put a speed camera up, and it got shot. Yeah. Someone, well, just, and, someone was like, I don't want that there anymore, and shot it down. In Europe, <laughs> all the time. They yeah. blow those things up. Oh, yeah. the speed well, in France, detectors. they put on their yellow vests, and they riot. Oh, well, we, yeah, well, yeah, but <laughs> when, when they riot, we'll destroy all those freaking things in that region. Like, mm -hmm. uh, where my dad lives in the Pyrenees, I can't tell you how many hundreds of thousands of dollars in speeding cameras and tickets were just were just destroyed by the people of the region. We're just like, we don't even speed or care to even have that in this area. Yeah. And they will just go with a truck at night with a rope and tear it down, mm -hmm. you know, or something else like that. Either way, let's go back. So we start with the Ducati community um, being more integrated with like heritage, families, religion, and everything in Europe, which makes sense because it's smaller. Like you could throw a stone in any direction, Western Europe, and be in a different country. Like if you were really Ducati, Ducatis enthusiast, and you want to get your bike from the factory, I'm sure you could call your local dealership, have something arranged, and then do something where you go down to Italy and pick it up, which is not the same here. And obviously our cultures are very different because we are trying to not be Europeans, but we want to ride European bikes in the United States and have that European uh, status and vibe, like as if we were driving a Lamborghini and a Ferrari. Mm. But how does that translate? And I mean, not even how does that translate, we're just pointing out the differences that I feel like more people obviously buy Ducati's United States for uh, a show and a glamour and a status. Mm -hmm more than in Europe where they buy for lifestyle, culture, and community mm -hmm. uh, because that's how they were raised. And again, you can't blame or pick or choose, but um, knowing that and us knowing the difference now, which one do we like more? It's I, not, no, not even which one do we like more. All the cars are the same, but which one would you want to participate and be a part so, of more? Like you said, with the, it's almost like a status thing. People in America buy the Ducati because it's like, I'm gonna buy this, I'm gonna put it on my Instagram, I'm gonna be able to join these clubs, I'm gonna, it, it, they're buying it for a planned group of purposes. Like, I know 10 different things I'm gonna do with my bike before I even get it. But, like, leading up to the purchase, it's all like, when I bought mine, it's all cram time. Like, what am I gonna do with this? Am I buying this $3,000 motorcycle because it's the right thing to do? Like, blah, blah, blah. in Europe, it's like, well, and then back to, back to the United States real quick, we have credit. You don't even have to like dream that hard to yeah. walk into a dealership, put a few thousand dollars down, and now you have your dream bike. True. In Europe, it's like my dad saved for 30 years to buy his Ducati. I'm going to do it in 15 because of this passion I have, and I'm going to go buy it in cash, and it's going to be my bike, and they're going to treat it like that, like you do. They're going to wash it every single day. They're going to check every single spec. If any little piece is wrong, or it's going to get replaced and fixed immediately before yeah. they even go and ride it again. Yeah. Like, my, you know. They're born into that lifestyle. Yeah, they're born into that. It's just what I versus... talking about. It's like the lifestyle of Ducati. Are you really like born, or not born, but like are you buying into the brand more than just a show bike, but it's mm -hmm. actually like a, a piece of your lifestyle, your community, mm -hmm. revolves around your friends, your wife, your house, your cat, your dogs, your garage? Or is it just like, um, you know, there, there's both, man. There's, there's people like me, and then there's people who buy the Super Legeras who want that status, and then maybe to ride it once or twice in Laguna Seca, but just have it as an art piece. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a little bit of those all over the world, but how the United States is much more spread across than obviously Western Europe mm -hmm. um, and being able to commute and move around and especially the circuits out there. Mm -hmm. Their racing scene in Europe is obviously a lot bigger, yeah. far wider and grander than what we have here in the United States. Because it, it can, when I look at some of the things that Ducati 
the, like the French cups, the Italian cups, the Spanish cups. Or every like, country has a cup. Yeah, every, every <laughs> country has a cup that they ride on these amazing MotoGP circuits. And then when you come to like uh, Superbike America, you have these circuits with like Josh Heron and all these other great riders and now, and now Pedrucci and all these other Italian motorcycle racers coming to ride in the United States, but they ride on these circuits that are like patched apart mm. with huge like road bumps and things where if a rider would hit, they'd go flying off. Not that great of safety regulations. And it's like a... It's way more intense and rugged here for the Ducati racing scene than it is in Europe, just due to the lifestyle of circuits they have here. They don't have that heritage, that background, that racing inspiration, at least in the Ducati uh, motorcycle world mm -hmm. in the niche of the United States, like how they do in Europe. It's, um, it's difficult, but then you have guys like Josh Heron on a V2 that just could kill it on any circuit. And I'm so excited to see him on what he could do this year for a V4 because I think it'll show a good balance on how capable a super bike rider should be. Because, mm -hmm. like, think about it. Let's say Josh wins um, this season and he kills it and he's, uh, you know, the high-class super bike uh, world champion. The next thing for him to do would to go to world, world super bike mm -hmm. internationally, all over, mm -hmm. you know, to compete with uh, Chad Davis, uh, Baltista, all those guys who mm -hmm. just won last year as well. Um, but Josh would have a harder, he, he would have already went through the harder course mm -hmm. in time because he already rode harder circuits than those guys ever would ride. Yeah. So if Josh could go from winning this year's uh, World, or World AMA Superbike Championship to going to World Superbike internationally, I think he would have, a, he, he would have an advantage. Mm -hmm. He would have a straight up advantage because every, everything else is wider, smoother, and nicer, and he's having to deal with much difficult technical road snaky on surface tracks here mm -hmm. and so i'm um, i know we're just switching subjects but i'm really curious to see that and i feel like that has a lot to do with again we were talking about the differences between um the ducati season and, europe and, and yeah, yeah europe and well that's States. what i was gonna say is uh, do you i was gonna ask you but you answered it is do you think he's going to struggle more or less having the more defined tracks like the tracks out here it's like you know some guys like we need a track what's gonna go on the track i don't care like anything goes on this track go-karts, race cars, Formula One, like everything, we're just a track, it's here. You know, use it as well, and motorcycles are kind of allowed on, versus over there, it's like, well, this was built for a motorcycle, but we'll allow cars on it. Yeah. Um, so do you think that because it's smoother, because it's nicer, he's actually going to be able to perform like the people who have grown up on this beautifully smooth track? Because maybe Josh, the only thing I see is because he's used to cluck it in a corner, and he doesn't necessarily know the response of the road, and he's used to like you know maybe the front comes up, maybe it moves a little bit. It's and he's all over the place. Now he's less all over the place, and it's more about very precise turns because you Higher can speeds. trust your road and you can trust your bike that it will take that. Versus, yes, you have the skill to slide it into a corner, into a rough road, hit some tar snakes, and still come out of it. But like you, you went into it with that, you went in losing traction, you went in like already getting ready to rough up the bike and take that corner slower than if you had a perfectly smooth surface on a bike that you know and you have to be absolutely precise with your body position to take it because you're taking this corner at however fast. Okay, so I agree with you. It's going to be about uh, adapting the change and also environment and uh, the circuit, but here's what I think he will do well. And this comes from my mountain biking background when I used to race downhill. I trained in Sedona, which had very narrow, choppy single track. Mm. If you could train on a much smaller line, mm. even if you're on a big circuit and you're following cones, if you could train on a much smaller line, when you do have more space, mm. you are initially faster and can be able to see and take things at a, at a, at a wider speed and risk because you've already train yourself to be on that one smaller line because that's what you used to ride before. So mm -hmm. I know what you're saying by him having to get used to adapting to the speed of the wider corners and the whole surface area. But if he's already really fast on a smaller single track that's not surface and smooth and stuff like that and he's having to be a little bit quarter, shorter and faster, mm -hmm. I think that'll essentially make him quicker. And that's what I'm really wanting to see because it's going to be hit or miss. He's going to be quicker and he's going to be able to adapt to that. Or you're, like, like you said, there's going to be people that are just going to be flying around, mm -hmm. taking way bigger corners and lines and apexes like, that he's probably used to, yeah. and he's just going to get dropped behind. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a balance, and that's a good 
point between the United States and Europe because again it's a culture I feel like the more of the motorcycle whole anything racing scene grew up a lot more in Europe than it did in the United States and in the United States on the West Coast we have a big thing you know Harley Davidson that's kind of like more seen was the old Harley flat track NASCAR mm -hmm. sort of inspiration racing until they got more into the world Superbike, and then they opened circuits like Laguna Seca Chuck Walla and there's a great one in Utah and there's a Minneapolis raceway as well but um, you can just see that's completely changed and it's funny that we talk about this because I think that affects mm -hmm. the community mm -hmm. especially who likes to follow what and who also wants to get into like a sport bike racing mm -hmm. scene whether it be the United States or Europe you know yeah and I actually I just thought of a funny topic that uh, that we could touch on is a lot of Europeans want to come over to America and ride a Harley yeah Hollywood, bro. It's, Come on, Route 66, seems, easy rider, bro. Every time I see a Harley rider riding down the 101 or the 10 or something like that, and the handlebars just barely shaking. Oh, it's so bad. And I'm just like, they have no helmet on, yeah. and you know their vest, and I'm just yeah. like, how? How are you gonna sit and do that for? I mean, America's Dude. big. <laughs> You're gonna be on this road for 300 Dude, it's, miles. It's that experience, that lifestyle. They'll see someone driving from like Las Vegas to California on a Harley, and it's just that desert vibe, going through the salt flats, all that stuff. And like I get it, because for us, we're like we want to go to Magello I and rip around a Ducati. Turn. Yeah, I just exactly. want the road to turn. But for them, that's like for them, they're like it's we normal. did that. Like we yeah. grew up there and stuff like that. So again, it's it's you know it's different opinions and also experience that people want to do. But I'm sure when you get those people who are like, oh, I want to do that Harley mm -hmm. thing, they're gonna have the experience in the Harley and never do it again. Yeah. How could you go from <laughs> touring or sport touring or riding circuits in Europe on Ducati motorcycles? having experience in the United States riding a Harley and then be like, oh, I want to go back to that. You just, you just, it's not that you can't, but no, you can. You can't, you can. no, you can. there's no way. You could get a Harley and then maybe put around it after, but you're not going to be doing big tours and stuff like that because mm -hmm. the advancement of technology between Ducati and Harley is, is two different worlds we can't compare, but I mean, if you start riding a Ducati, you're most definitely not going to switch over to a Harley Davidson for now, if you start, If you start in a touring Ducati, like the Multistrada or something that's yeah, designed even, to go long distance. Even though, you know, those bikes destroy on distance circuits or whatever, you know. Oh, yeah. It's a whole different conversation we can get into. But yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. That's what I, like, honestly, I would say those are my biggest, those are some of the biggest differences uh, between Ducati Europe and Ducati North America is the whole on, not online, but I'd say the whole Hollywood scene of how Ducati Motorcycles is, is portrayed in the United States and then how original and organic it is used in Europe. It's like people, like when you go to Italy and you ride a Ducati, it's like, ah, you know, it's like, oh, you ride a Ducati? Like, and they even ask you which one. It's just like, oh, Ducati, yeah, good for you. Guy. You know, it's like the normal thing. It's like here driving in Arizona, you have a Mustang. Mm -hmm. Good for you, bro, which Mustang 5.0 <laughs> or the Shelby, like whatever, like it's all cool. But um, they, even with that energy still in Italy, they were able to create like, uh, uh, you know, the same sort of owners group and, and enthusiasts, you know, like they're, they're, the Italians are even more passionate bit passionate about their Ducati motorcycles and even some people in Europe and France, Italy, Germany, or the States, you know, yeah. which is really cool to see. When I went to, um, when I was in Milan for the ICMA um, show, we went, we got invited to the Hyper Motard uh, club ride of Ducati Milan. Mm -hmm. And it was strictly, it, it was like, imagine this in Phoenix, imagine if we had different club, or imagine we had such a big community, we had different club rides for just specific models of motorcycles. Like there's Ducati Hyper Mortard. Yeah. There's Ducati Phoenix Pentagon. There's Ducati Phoenix, like, you know, uh, Multistrada mm -hmm. or Pikes Peak. They had that going on in Italy. Yeah. Where it wasn't just, you know, Ducati thing. Like, like they, you would literally just ride with your own model of motorcycle. Yeah. And it was, those guys Which did a fantastic I feel like that's job. a good way of, that's how they divide up their groups because you get, I feel like riders, there's a good comparison. Riders in Europe, they know what they want to ride and they know, like, how they, because they, again, it comes to that learning thing. Like, hey, my grandfather, my dad taught me all about bikes, how they perform, what bike's better for this. Like, versus me, I had absolutely no one in my family ever tell me about what motorcycles to buy. Yeah. It was just motorcycles are dangerous. And so I had to figure out do I like supermotos? Do I like going on this bike? Do I want the crotch rocket? Do I want the this, that, and Versus in Europe, it's like, I'm 20, I can buy my first motorcycle. I'm buying a Hyper because I grew up around supermotos. I love the supermoto racing. I'm doing a Hyper because I know I can do all this kind of stuff. Or I'm going to get a Panigale, and they, they ride it like they're supposed to. In the United States, I could have any level of riding knowledge and go that's pick out the Panigale. That's true. But I shouldn't be riding necessarily with all the other people riding SPs, you would think, because the SP people would be flying around the corners and going super fast and way faster than I could ever hope 
but that isn't the truth. You'll have 10 people own a, owning Panigales, and every single one of them rides extremely different than the other one at a completely different speed, and it's like completely different line. Everything they do is different because it's like most people are, I feel like, in the United States are, I bought my first motorcycle. No one else in my family had a motorcycle. Or maybe my dad rode a Harley or that yeah, kind of thing. It's not part of the culture. They grew it's up not part of it. it. So they're just, yeah. they're experimenting with whatever bike it is that they need to get on and try to go ride. Versus in Europe, it's like, well, I've already watched a million MotoGP races. I've seen a bunch of, I ride motorcycles. I've ridden dirt bikes. I go on the supermoto tracks. I've rented out the hypermotard. And I'm going to be, like, and all the hypers will ride together because everyone that has the hyper grew up with that same thing. Yeah, it's like Or they're like, my family's super racy. I already know I'm going to be the best on a Panigale, so I'm going to buy a Panigale and all the Panigales, they book it. That's so true. And I want to come back to like two of the biggest differences now that I, that I realize this now is the licensing. Like we have A1 and A2 in Europe. Oh, yeah. And so like when you're, I'm not sure if you guys know this, when you're 21 years old in Europe, you're allowed to have 600 cc's. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when you're like 15, 14, you have to be like 50 cc's or 125. When you turn 18, I think you could have 600. Oh, yeah, and then when you turn 21, you could have a, a, a leader, leader bike. bike. Yeah. But in the United um, States, you could be 16 and buy a leader bike. Yeah, so we have, <laughs> we have like, you have people in the United States drive, buying their dream Ducatis when they're 15 and a half or 16 and being either on a Super Leger or an SP, which you can. But you, they, in Europe, they would never, never, ever they allow that. They wouldn't even that. sell it to you. They, you couldn't buy it. They you just even, couldn't buy it if yeah, you had the they money. They would definitely not be able to sell it to you. And that's like a major thing that also plays with, you know, how groups get, get involved and how people, you know, get tied into Ducati because you'll have that 15-year-old or 16-year-old praying till when he's 30 or 40 to buy the bike mm -hmm. when you have someone here in Arizona who just bought it at that age. Yeah. So it's completely crazy. And I had... Well, look at how they even... Uh, like, it was licensing and, like, media, yeah. Yeah, the difference in between, like... So I've seen a bunch of... Uh, from Cyanide, do we follow it on Instagram? I've only followed when we went to... We met him at Mizano, I think. Um... Or where no, Amsterdam, yeah. Amsterdam. Cyanide 81, Ducati yeah. Amsterdam, brand ambassador. We love you. We miss you, bro. We're talking about you right now. Mm -hmm. Follow our podcast. So Cyanide 81, we collaborated with after we did our dealership shoot at Ducati Amsterdam. And go on. Yeah. So, like, he posts some crazy European bikes that you can tell, like, it looks like a V4R, it looks like this, but it's just someone that took the V4S and they actually turned it into what exactly they wanted on their motorcycle. That doesn't, I feel like, that happens in a different way out here. Whereas if you're going to buy a bike like that, it's just, I mean, it's the approach I would take is, well, there's an option there to have all of that built on. I'm just going to buy that. Yeah. Without knowing anything about why it's the way it is, that's just the normal out here is, like, get the SP, get the this. Yeah. In Europe, you have, like, even, like, Fearcon. He was, like, he bought a V4S, the Street Fighter, and he turned it into the coolest-looking V4S Street Fighter I've ever seen. Yeah. And then he got an SP, and at first I was, like, Oh, he's just going to get the SP and he's going to leave it like this. But then he turned that SP into the coolest freaking SP yeah, I've ever yeah. seen. He they made don't, a better SP They don't version. keep their bike yeah. like it came out of the thing because they bought it and it goes back to everything. Like They bought it because of they're passionate, they're super passionate about it, and they worked really fucking hard yeah. to get the money to Much even enjoy that passion yeah. than you do in America. You yeah. don't have to work. You still have to have a job. You still have to do your things. But if you wanted to jump on the equivalent bike and be in America, then you only got to be 18. You've only got to work for a couple of years and have the employment, and then you got to bring some cash for the down payment, and yeah. like your new SP is yours. Like, so, are you saying, and I'm getting where you're coming from, are you saying that due to the fact uh, from the lifestyle and the economy and, you, and how Europe is and how we can't finance, they can't finance bikes like how we can here, they're more core and passionate because they took that much more time and effort absolutely. to be an enthusiast, mm -hmm. to save up, to work just so they could get this one more yeah. cycle and customize just how they want, mm -hmm. versus people here who just either finance a bike their friends sold them to or bought it off the garage or, like, again, Hollywood. For me, I just say Hollywood because when I say Hollywood, I'm talking about media oh. and advertising and marketing and social media. And that's true. I think I'll agree with Michael on that. And that is just because they're in a different part of the world, a whole different lifestyle, but it makes it more difficult for them to get the higher-end Ducati they want when someone in the United States like myself could just finance the Pikes Peak and ride out of the dealership like how I did. And I think those are, I could say, maybe those are the two biggest differences. Mm -hmm. I would say is the licensing mm -hmm. and the fact that they can't have access uh, financially as easy as we can here in the yeah. United States. And I think that also translates to their passion behind the bike. You have people that buy a V4 here to go maybe 130 in a straight line and be like, well, that was crazy fast. And then you have the same person buy that same bike in Europe. And all they care about is like, 
I'm going to be the next GP racer and I'm going to ride every day like it's that. Like this is yeah. absolutely what I want to go out and do. And then even when they go for like a joy ride or a, a fun ride, I mean, I remember going for joy rides and fun rides with my friends and it would be like, yeah, we do some pulls, maybe do a couple here races, but for the most part, you're just kind of riding. All the time in Europe when we went out with well, friends, so much. they're like, like watch this like and they just they go for it they just yeah. they really ride but it's not even like they don't have to try very hard to ride that way because they just ride that way because the inspiration for getting the motorcycle is what led them to actually learning how to be a better rider yeah. versus well, i just jumped on this from Pentagali and i have to even learn how that fucking clutch works like but it was called me... it's culture too too it's culture before that as well because they were riding bicycles yeah and they were leaning dragging their and drifting yeah. and mountain biking and doing all sorts of stuff. And then they went to the scooters, wrecked a bunch of scooters, and then they got their 125 <laughs> scooter that's built like a hybrid motor tire. They completely tracked and destroyed that. And then they did a little bit of motocross, and then they got on their bike. So they mm -hmm. have, like, this huge advantage mm -hmm. of culture behind that's pushing them just to ride on two wheels, regardless if it's going to be racing or not. Mm -hmm. It's just this huge aspect here in the States where we don't have any of that. Like, luckily for me, my father did. I grew up riding motocross, mountain mm -hmm. bikes, all that stuff. But normally, like all my normal friends, like uh, like you, you just got your you, you got your DRZ 450 Supermoto. Luckily for you, that was like a good start. Uh, well, I also I did downhill mountain biking as well, so I already I already loved mountain bikes. Okay, like cool. That. But yeah. I got really hurt and I had to stop for a while, and that's where my friend was like, "There's this awesome thing. They take dirt bikes and they put street tires on them." And I'm like, "Holy shit! Ground, Supermoto. This is life changing." Yeah. And but Supermoto, just you know, they grew up in Europe. It started oh, in France. Absolutely. The French bikers took their dirt bikes, put street tires on, and created supermotos. Yeah. That's like their culture, their religion. Mm -hmm. So some of the best pilots in the world are supermoto pilots, oh, yeah. and they're from France, and, you know, all the MotoGP racers, if you see any of the guys nowadays. It's one of the most entertaining races to watch. Oh, it's a supermoto, especially the ones in amazing. France, like their grand, like, they, and it's they crazy have, to see them, like. street circuits yeah. and dirt circuits. Like, they have hybrids, berms and they just paved. go both on, yeah. Yeah, they have, like, a, a berm. I, that's a complete concrete fishbowl wall mm -hmm. that the guys will just rip it around the bike. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Oh, and if you guys don't follow us enough, uh, as you see, we do stuff at PKRA, which is a small go-kart circuit where we actually take out smaller pit bikes and try to simulate what guys do in their supermotos so we can understand the feeling of dragging, sliding, drifting, and braking, and downshifting, and getting the whole rear end of the bike to slide out because those bike handling skills will translate onto the road, which mm -hmm. eventually will keep you safe when something crazy happens. Either than that, I think it's time to wrap up. I think we made a strong point over our whole discussion and topic on the differences between uh, Ducati Europe and um, North America, United States. And I think it boils down to those two things is obviously the licensing, mm -hmm. getting the permission to ride certain bikes at certain ages for whether from 16 to 21, and also the financial capabilities from society allowing people to, younger people to get the higher end motorcycle at a no to reasonable cost for mm -hmm. financing. So. I think that um, I think that ties into the um, I mean what, what builds that culture as well like you and like you asked like what's the difference between DROC and Phoenix Ducati Club is they're all they're all relatively the same you have just this mixture of people who can afford to get into that industry and then you go to Europe with it and it's like it doesn't matter about whether or not you could afford to be in the scene it's like do you share that real same passion that besides life, just yeah. owning the motorcycle. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you lived in a shack and you had your Pentagale or you lived in a mansion and you had your Pentagale. Like in Europe, they're going to treat you the same based on how you're riding that bike. Yeah, totally. Versus in America, it's like, well, how'd you get that bike? Yeah. Talk to okay. me about that. Quick question. But, uh, and to yeah. answer that question with, with a different question. What do you think would be more, or why do you think they have World Bike Week in Europe versus the United States? Because I think more people came. More, more, exactly. people, more people would show up no, more on their Ducati, not trailering their Ducati. Yeah. More people would show up saying, I just rode three days from Norway yeah. to which Italy. Which they did. Which they and did. And like everybody else, like, I just rode three days, give me my spot, I'm parking my bike, look at my bike, look how amazing it is, look what it just did. In America, it'd be like, my toy hauler's got four Ducatis in it. Yeah, that's I brought, so I brought all four of my bikes here. Who, like, okay. Yeah, there's cool. a guy in Germany from the top of Germany yeah. with his girlfriend. He drove his 1299 Pentagalli all the way down and made it happen. Either way, that's another session. Yeah.